And we start with this Fox News alert. Hurricane Harvey barreling toward the Gulf Coast, gaining strength as it moves closer to Corpus Christi, Texas. Thousands of residents in seven counties ordered to get out while they still can with this dangerous Category 2 storm set to make landfall late tonight or early tomorrow morning. But its effects already being felt. Good morning to you. I'm John Scott. Yeah, it is a whopper. Mm -hmm. I'm Heather Childers. Uh, thanks for joining us. Harvey, the first major hurricane taking aim at the Texas coast in 12 years, as a matter of fact. Forecasters warned that it could bring three feet of rain, 129 mile per hour winds, and 12 foot storm surges. Millions of Americans lie in its path, along with almost one third of the nation's oil refineries. President Trump pledging federal help for Texas as people along the coast decide whether to pack up and go or waited out what will be a catastrophic storm. But well, my wife and I, we, we usually always joke about it because every time they say it's going to be real big, it usually goes another direction. But I'm going to take the extra precautions just in case because I don't want to get stuck. Casey Stiegel live from Galveston, Texas now with the latest on the storm. Casey. John, you know, the conditions are constantly changing, as we well know, with these tropical systems. It's really quiet now. In fact, no, hardly not raining. There's really no wind to speak of. But boy, have there been times this morning where it was completely opposite. You could hardly see there was so much rain and the winds gusting 50, even 60 miles per hour where we are right here on the Gulf of Mexico. But if there is any indicator of what is to come, despite what we're seeing now, you can see there conditions on the Gulf right now. That water doesn't look nice out there, does it? Very choppy, lots of white caps. Folks we've talked to here in Galveston are anxious. This community has been decimated by hurricanes before we know, and news that Harvey is strengthening has added just an extra layer of fear. The essentials, water, batteries, rain gear, flying off of store shelves all up and down the Texas and Louisiana coast for that matter. This is video from a business in Houston where supplies eventually ran out. Emergency officials say time is running out to evacuate. Otherwise, those who decide to stay could be essentially on their own. They can say voluntary, but if someone's saying that, to me, that means I should pack, I should secure my house, I should get my vehicle or catch the bus and go to a shelter. The storm is going to check, the storm could change, and as they've said, they're not going to come rescue once it gets bad. And, you know, that is something that a lot of people don't think about. You sort of assume that if you get into any kind of trouble that first responders will be available. Well, if we get a tremendous amount of rain that is forecasted, some areas could be flooded out and first responders can't even reach them. It is too dangerous. So that is why this is a very big decision on whether people will listen to the evacuation orders or whether they will um, choose to sit here and ride this thing out. But the biggest fear with Harvey is that it is going to essentially stall. That is what all of the models seem to indicate, that once it makes landfall, south of us down near Corpus Christi that it will slowly move inland and essentially sit over the region for days which is why so much rain is forecasted through Monday Tuesday even into Wednesday of next week and that's why some spots are projected to receive three feet of rain and that could be catastrophic John Category 2 storm right now and potentially could get even stronger, huh, Casey? Yeah, that's right. The National Hurricane Center is watching this closely. They say that there are uh, a couple of items at play here. The water in the Gulf of Mexico right now is extremely warm. And there's also some upper atmosphere uh, layering that's going on that allows this to sort of strengthen. Mm. And it feeds off of that warm water in the Gulf. And the latest information coming from the National Weather Service out of Galveston and Houston this morning, they said that they expect that this to continue to intensify up until the moment it makes landfall tonight or into the early morning hours tomorrow, John. Casey Stiegel joining us from the shore there at Galveston, Texas. Casey, thank you.
Well, President Trump going after lawmakers in his own party as Republicans face increasing pressure to pass spending bills, avoid a government shutdown next month. A lot of work to be done. The president tweeting this this morning. If Senate Republicans don't get rid of the filibuster rule and go to a 51 percent majority, few bills will be passed. Eight Dems control the Senate. Joining me now is Glenn Hall. He's the U.S. News Editor for The Wall Street Journal. Thank you for joining us this morning on this Friday. Always a pleasure. <laughs> well, after that tweet, uh, the president posted another tweet. And in this tweet, he was going after Senator Bob Corker. And he said, strange statement by Bob Corker, considering that he's constantly asking me whether or not he should run again in 18. Tennessee, not happy. This tweet from this morning was in response to some criticism from Senator Cahork uh, regarding uh, President Trump's reaction to the violence in Charlottesville, Virginia. Let's listen to what he said. The president has not yet, um, has not yet been able to demonstrate the stability uh, nor some of the confidence that he needs to demonstrate in order to be successful. And uh, we need for him to be successful. Our nation needs for him to be successful. Okay, so we have Senator Bob Corker, we have Mitch McConnell, we have uh, Paul Ryan, Senator Jeff Flake. Uh, how do all of these, you know, very public back and forth impact the work that needs to be done? Yeah, they're, they're a complicating factor in some cases. Um, in the case of, uh, of, of Senator Corker, you know, we've seen time and again when the president feels like he's being criticized by someone, regardless which party, he's going to let them know how he feels about it and he's going to push back against that. And, you know, uh, Jerry Seib, our Washington columnist, he was looking at sort of this series series of, of tweets and, and back and forth with the, with the Congress and, and the President. And he was saying, look, there's one of three things are going on, right? On the one hand, it could be that the President is trying to put pressure on them to go the direction that he wants them to go. On the other hand, he could be showing to his base, hey, I'm the independent that you hired mm -hmm. and I'm doing things my way. To clear out the swamp That's regardless right. of political party. Yeah. And the third is just the simple, uh, you know, response to criticism. And sometimes, uh, you know, he is not going to stand for it. He's human. Yeah. You know, any of us, although people say all the time, don't respond on Twitter. Someone <laughs> needs to tell him do that. But that's uh, his most powerful yeah, platform. It, it really is. And, and it is, you know, a large reason that he got to the White House was Twitter. And he knows that, so he uses it to his advantage. You know, some of the headlines, I was looking through these. Uh, Trump fences himself in with the border wall spending. GOP taken aback by Trump's verbal bombs. Uh, Trump takes pot shots at GOP leaders as fiscal crisis looms. There's a lot of work, seriously, that does need to be done, specifically in September. Uh, if the work is not done, like if the Obamacare repeal right. was not done. Is this a strategic move by the president to separate himself from Republicans? It could be a move to show that independence, to show, look, I'm standing for what I promised to do for the American people who elected me. I promised to build this wall. The wall's going to get done. If the Congress can't support me, I'm going to have to push on that. And that, that could be the strategy that he's taking. Um, you know, you made a good point there that when Congress comes back after Labor Day, they've got just about 12 days to mm -hmm. figure out how to raise the debt ceiling and fund the government. And of which some of those are travel days. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so th that's a really tight deadline. You're yeah. probably going to see some kind of stopgap measure because of the shortness of time. Yeah, you mentioned the border wall. Uh, he has made it clear via Twitter that he is willing to shut down the government as a result of that. Uh, tweets like that in terms of policy, uh, how does that impact Democrats? along with all the criticism, the public criticism. Back well, yeah, what we're hearing from Democrats like uh, Senator Chuck Schumer here in New York is, hey, great, thank you for that, because now you own the problem. Mm -hmm. If you make that, you know, the gating factor, we've made it clear as Democrats, we do not support that wall. If that's what you want, you're not going to get any help from us. Um, so now it's on you and your party to figure out how to get the votes. Mm -hmm. Does he really risk a lot, though, going um, after Congress? Because we know they are notorious for having very low favorability scores across America. Yeah, well, you know, the Congress is in a bind on its own, right? So so the last time we had a shutdown in 2013, many people blamed the House-controlled GOP for that. And now there's a number of members of Congress right now in the GOP who are worried about what it would look like when they control the House and the Senate mm -hmm. and the White House and they can't fund the government. Um, that is a worry for the midterms. So I think the pressure uh, in that equation is more on the Republicans. Yeah, there was at least one poll that we were looking at earlier, and uh, Mitch McConnell has the lowest favorability uh, ratings of anyone. So. Yeah, and, you know, Mitch McConnell's office would answer that and did answer that to say, hey, look, that is normal. We have not got some of the legislation passed that we wanted, so you've got to own the failure. When you get the success, you see the, the ratings might change. All right, then get the success. Uh, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. John?
Well, President Trump loves to call out what he calls the fake news media. So is there a strategy behind the constant attacks? Our panel weighs in. But the very dishonest media, those people right up there with all the cameras. On some crime stories that we're watching, a newborn was found in North Dakota, not far from where a 22-year-old woman disappeared over the weekend. A Savannah Gray win was eight months pregnant, but police do not yet know if the infant is her baby. Well, a judge in Kentucky ordering a new trial in a satanic killing case, the judge throwing out the 1995 convictions against Dwayne Clark and Gar Hardin, citing some new DNA evidence. And the two men were convicted of murder in the stabbing death of a woman who was dating Hardin at the time. They both spent more than 20 years in prison. And the state of Florida carrying out its first execution in over a year with a drug never used before in a lethal injection case. 53-year-old Mark Assay was sentenced to death for two racially motivated murders back in 1987. Truly dishonest people in the media and the fake media. They make up stories. They have no sources in many cases. They say a source says there is no such thing. But they don't report the facts. Well, verbal attacks on journalists and their employers, pretty routine for President Trump. The president again called out the media this morning in a tweet praising his chief of staff. The president tweeting, General John Kelly is doing a fantastic job as chief of staff. There is tremendous spirit and talent in the White House. Don't believe the fake news. Let's get into it with Philip Wegman, a commentary writer for the Washington Examiner. Eric Felton is managing editor for the Weekly Standard. Thanks, both of you, for being here. Philip, uh, you have written that the president is addicted to media criticism. I, I assume that means uh, addicted to criticizing the media? Well, I think the president fueled his campaign early on with media criticism, but he got hooked somewhere along the way, and he hasn't been able to kick the habit. It's not helping him at this point. Every time he lashes out at the media, it shows that he's legislatively frustrated. He hasn't been able to get anything accomplished. And in Phoenix, he should have been pushing his, uh, his new strategy in Afghanistan. Instead, he changed the narrative, and that was to the detriment of his own agenda. Uh, Eric, do you see it the same way? I mean, are his attacks on the media helping his presidency or perhaps uh, helping inspire his base? Well, you have to ask what the strategy is that you would you would hope the president would have a strategy with what he's doing. Is it to shore up the base of, you know, 35 to 40 percent of solid supporters or is it to expand his base? To get things done politically, he needs to expand his base. I don't know that going after the media, though it's resonant with the base, helps him expand his support. Well, and he, he needs to expand his popularity on Capitol Hill as well, doesn't he, Philip? Absolutely. Eric is right. You can only uh, play to the base for so long. We're not campaigning at this point. Uh, we're trying to pass an agenda if you're the White House. Uh, this, this isn't helping him move forward. Look, we all knew that the mainstream media wasn't going to take kindly to a Republican administration. At this point, it's a waste of effort. President Trump needs to keep his eye on the ball and, and focus on what's actually going to chalk up a win. There is a uh, headline in Politico that I wanted to share with you. You've probably already seen it. It says, the media is Trump's evil empire. Uh, Rich Lowry wrote this. He writes, for most Republicans, what matters most about Donald Trump is that he's demonstrated massive resolve against the enemy, not the Islamic State or the Taliban, but the media. The media has become, for the right, what the Soviet Union was during the Cold War, a common unifying adversary of overwhelming importance. I guess the question, Eric, is uh, how long can that go on if, in fact, it's the case? And, and what, does, what does victory look like? I mean, we know what victory over the Soviet Union looked like. What does victory over the media look like? That's kind of a crazy notion. Look, the president is constantly hurting himself with this. You look at his response to Bob Corker today in a tweet. That was a story that had come and gone days ago. And by going after Bob Corker, the president uh, merely made it that people are re-airing those comments. So he tends to promote media that's damaging to him by his inability to not let things go. I'm kind of curious, Philip, because it's the media that, that made him a star. I mean, he was the subject of so many tabloid newspaper headlines in New York for decades, and then, of course, he went on to The Apprentice and sort of got invited into Americans' living, room, living rooms for 20 years. 
he didn't always get good press, but he got press. Yeah, I think that President Trump owes a lot to the media, and I think he knows that. He probably just wasn't expecting it to be so harsh and be so hard-hitting. But the fact of the matter is that CNN didn't undercut the health care debate. Uh, MSNBC isn't stopping tax reform, and, and none of no one in the mainstream media encouraged him to fire James Comey. The chaos that's coming out of the White House right now is his own, and I think that he needs to take a hard look at his own administration. He's doing a good job with Chief of Staff Kelly, who seems to be bringing order, but going after the media isn't going to help him. Is he, Eric, uh, you know, possibly going to vanquish some of his media enemies? Well, if he wants to try to vanquish his enemies, he, he has, he's famous for being a counterpuncher. But when to, to follow the boxing metaphor, if you always counterpunch, it lets your opponents know what you're going to do and set the agenda. Uh, I think the president, by focusing so much on the media, merely empowers the very media that he claims he's opposed to. And really, Philip, no president has ever loved the media or, or enjoyed fantastic relationships with the media. Absolutely. Has he? Well, to spin off of what Eric said there, the president seems to be trying to throw a haymaker at CNN, and he's throwing himself off balance every time he tries to make these attacks. Look, Reagan and the Bushes dealt with the same, perhaps less vicious media, but they knew how to play the game, and they're trying to win not personal victories that are petty against different journalists, but actually trying to get something substantive into law. And what about uh, Gary Cohn, his economic advisor? Uh, you know, he just put that piece, I think it was in the Financial Times, uh, with, with some very strong language, Philip, about, you know, how he feels about what the president should say and how he should respond to the neo-Nazis and so forth who, who uh, demonstrated in Charlottesville. Well, I think that if we've learned one thing in the this presidency, it's that President Trump, he speaks for himself. We've seen uh, the White House cycle through different communications uh, staffers. And at this point, what we're seeing Trump say is what Trump means. So the response to Charlottesville and the different iterations of it, that came from his consciousness and, and no one else's. I think there's a lot of frustration with the president within his own camp, but I don't expect this to end anytime soon. We're just getting word, Philip, that uh, Gary Cohn took with him a letter of resignation when he met with the president a week ago on Friday. It is not clear uh, whether that was submitted. In either case, it was not accepted. Uh, but then by going to the media, it seems like Gary Cohn is sort of, I don't know, absolving himself or at least making clear um, his positions that, that are contrary to the president's. I think that uh, for, while for, that might be an urge for different members of the administration, they need to be very careful. Remember, Scaramucci and both Steve Bannon seem to put the nails in their own career coffins by going to speak to the press. It backfired on them instead of helping them. So going it alone when talking to the media doesn't seem to be the best strategy for anyone in this administration. And, uh, well, all right, let, 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 Philip, let's get your, your take uh, on that. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting about Gary Cohn's case is it's an in instance of how difficult Donald Trump makes life for his allies and the people who work with him. I don't think the president recognizes how precarious his position is when he starts going after people on Capitol Hill. He's going after his allies. He's already making life difficult for his allies, and uh, he needs to have as many supporters as he can. I don't think you do that by attacking people via Twitter. Eric Felton, Weekly Standard, and Philip Wigman, Washington Examiner. Thank you. Thank you. Well, stay with us. We'll have more Fox News live team coverage of Hurricane Harvey. We'll hear from Texas Governor Greg Abbott, what the state is doing in the final hours before the storm makes landfall. Well, police and paramedics responding to an Australian university. That's where a student suddenly attacked classmates with what is described as a cricket or a baseball bat. Now, the classroom assault leaving four people injured. Police say that the suspect is in custody. No word on any possible motivation. John. An attack on a Shiite mosque in Kabul killing at least 20 people, leaving many more worshippers injured after a gunman set off an explosion during Friday morning prayers. Police now say all four attackers are dead. Crews are working to get the wounded out of the building. It comes as a top commander there speaks out about President Trump's new strategy in Afghanistan. This new policy is different 
It's conditions-based, not time-based, and our end state uh, is a, a peaceful reconciliation. That means there will be no terrorist attacks emanating from this region against the Afghan people or against uh, the United States and its allies. John Huddy is live for us from our Mideast Bureau with more. John. Yeah, well, John, so far no group has claimed responsibility for today's attack, but it certainly has all the signs of ISIS, as has been the case with attacks in the past on Shiite mosques like this one in Afghanistan, and not only Afghanistan, but uh, Iraq and Yemen as well. Uh, this particular attack today, John, uh, started when police say that a suicide bomber blew himself up at the entrance to the Imam Zaman Mosque, which is in the Afghan capital of Kabul. Three gunmen then stormed the building, according to police, opening fire on security guards there and worshipers inside, this happening during Friday prayers. There was a standoff that ended with all four attackers being killed killed and police say the cleric leading the prayers was also killed and we're getting reports at least 20 others are uh, are dead as well were killed in this attack and that number as we've seen in the past could certainly be higher as we wait for more information uh, this is the latest attack in Afghanistan and comes after president trump announced earlier this week as we know that another nearly 4000 american troops will be deployed to join us forces already on the ground in afghanistan in the fight against isis and the Taliban, both of which, John, have launched deadly attack, uh, deadly, deadly attacks on U.S. forces in a country ravaged by war, torn apart by war that has seen little peace. John. John Huddy in our Mideast Bureau. Thank you, John. Now this Fox News alert authorities ordering mandatory evacuations up and down the Texas coast as communities brace for Hurricane Harvey. It is expected to intensify into a Category 3 storm, making landfall with life-threatening force. Officials urging residents to heed their warnings. The storm surge has gone from a predicted 4 to 6 feet to a possible 10 feet. And at a 10-foot water height, you're going to be cut off from the island, and there's a good chance if you've got that much water, you're not going to have any electricity. So you'll be on an island with no electricity, no air conditioning, no water, no anything. So we are recommending in the strongest terms that if you live in those low-lying areas that you get out and you begin to get out now. Joining us now, Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Governor Abbott, uh, an hour and a half ago, the outer rain bands were already hitting the uh, southern and middle Texas coasts. I, I know that you are very concerned. What do you say to residents of your state? Well, the thing that I'm most concerned about right now is the fact that this storm has taken on uh, new and worsening uh, conditions uh, over the past 24, 48 hours. Uh, a couple of days ago, Texans assumed this was not going to be all that severe of a storm and not too many people evacuated. Uh, as you, as the prior commentator just said, uh, there is an urgent need uh, for people to evacuate as quickly as possible if you live in one of these low-lying areas, if you live in any area where local officials have uh, giving you a, a, a warning or a declaration uh, that you must evacuate. Uh, there is still time to get out, but understand this. The roads are getting crowded. There will be more people evacuating. Uh, the storm surge is about to hit. Uh, the rain bands will be coming down. It will be very, very difficult for you to evacuate more than 6 or 10 or uh, 12 hours from now. The time to get out is now, understanding that your life is far more important than your property. Uh, I know that Texas made plans after the last big hurricane uh, that hit there, and, and there was so much, you know, catastrophic <clears throat> traffic stall, frankly. Uh, do, do you feel that um, your, your state is ready, your emergency uh, crews have improved the plans to help get people out of there? We have prepared uh, very diligently for this hurricane for days now, uh, and we have uh, assets and resources uh, arrayed across the entire region uh, where this storm will strike. Uh, we're very well organized, and we have coordinated with the federal government, with FEMA, uh, with Homeland Security, and even with the president. And so we are prepared for this. 
That said, uh, we have two problems. Uh, one is because the storm is going to stall uh, over the state of Texas, it may uh, come in, go out, and come in again. The rainfall is going to be far greater than what people anticipate. The flooding will be very dramatic, and it's going to cause uh, long uh, problems for uh, many, many days. Uh, but again, the second thing is that uh, I'm concerned that not enough people have evacuated. Uh, as the, the person uh, right before us was talking about, there will be people who will be stranded on islands and in other places without power, without food, uh, without any type of necessities uh, for days on end. If you can evacuate, if you're listening to this, if you're in a, in a low-lying region, uh, if, you can, if you can evacuate, you should try to evacuate in the next few hours. The stalling of this storm is, I know, of great concern. Uh, Governor, we're going to ask you a couple of more questions about that. We have to take a quick break. If you'd be good enough to stay with us, we'll be right back with Governor Greg Abbott of Texas.